Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today for what I think is gonna be a really uh, wonderful discussion. Um, the campus, it's cloudy here in South Bend, uh, like it is for many days of the year, um, but it's exciting. There's an excitement to the campus because um, a couple hundred uh, of our students are already back. The RAs, our training and other student leaders are back here on campus getting ready for um, the move-in weekend, which will begin uh, in many ways this weekend, the, the official move-in for um, half of the first year class will be Monday, Tuesday, and the other half will be Wednesday, Thursday, and then the upperclassmen and women will move in the rest of the week, and, and next week, uh, Monday, August 10th, uh, will be the first day of classes. Uh, um, say a prayer for all those students that are in those old dorms that are unair conditioned uh, of the fourth floor of some of these dorms is gonna be, since we're starting earlier, warmer than, than, than ever. And uh, even those big fans don't do the trick in some of those uh, weather days, but uh, they, these, these young kids have grit and they'll be able to, uh, uh, to manage uh, well. Um, uh, one of the great things about Notre Dame it doesn't matter what dorm they get assigned to, but the end by the end of the first semester, they all think they're in the best dorm on campus. So, um, so we're excited to have the students back. There's an energy uh, to campus that is uh, that is palpable, and all of the precautions and and the communications are very much in place. and And uh, we're going to give it a shot and uh, and pray for the best. So, um, we're really excited to welcome two relatively new faculty members to our chat today. Uh, both of them joined us in uh, 2017, so they've been with us for about three years. Professor Mark Sanders is an eminent scholar of African-American and Afro-Latino literature, and he is a member of our English department. And LaDonna Forsgren is an expert on African-American theater and performance. She's part of the film, television, and theater uh, department. And uh, welcome to you both. It's really great uh, to be with you. I look forward to our conversation. Let's start with uh, a question for Mark. Would you, could you start out, Mark, and share with us a little bit of your, your story, um, you know, about your family, where you grew up, and your educational background, and, and uh, your career in the academy? Sure, Lou. Thank you. First, I just wanted to say thank you so much for for hosting us. This is a wonderful opportunity. I've heard your conversations with other uh, faculty members and leaders on campus. And so this is a great program and really happy to be a part of it. Um, yeah, I grew up in a um, academic household. Both of my parents were uh, college professors uh, at, at an HBCU and historically black university, North Carolina Central University in Durham, North Carolina, where my sister and I grew up. Uh, and so we grew up in a household full of books and music. Um, both my parents were voracious readers and my father was a violinist. Uh, so uh, we, um, we had lots of music. My sister was a very, very good musician as well, both a pianist and a, and a, um, and a cellist. And so um, my, the background for my parents, I think is instructive in terms of what I think both my sister and I received in that uh, both of them uh, began in very humble beginnings, um, first in their generation to go to college and first in their generation to uh, get uh, masters and PhDs and become college professors. And so they uh, demonstrated a real sense of perseverance and you, call, you use the word grit for our undergraduates, uh, grit on their part as well uh, to make it through all the way to, uh, to gaining um, graduate degrees and then teaching for 30 years at North Carolina Central University. Um, when we were young, we would get out of school and go to campus and we would sit in the back of our parents' classes and do our homework. And so we got to see them teach and we got to see them really invest in their students, invest in a sense of curiosity and lifelong learning uh, and the discipline required to do the work on a regular basis to get where you need to be intellectually. Uh, and so um, I think I, I kind of imbibed that fairly mm -hmm. early. As an undergraduate, I went to Oberlin College uh, and I taught in local elementary schools and local uh, 
summer programs uh, for high school students. When I got to graduate school at Brown, um, I was teaching for the requirement for, um, for teaching undergraduate courses, but also teaching in an alternative school just because I really enjoyed the process of teaching and engaging with students. And so um, I think I got from my, my parents a sense that um, um, an investment in the life of the mind, investment in inquiry uh, is more than just kind of acquiring a, a middle-class job as it were, but it's a way of engaging the world around you. And specifically for my parents who were teaching uh, predominantly uh, black students, it was a way to educate them to participate more fully in the community around them. They really saw education as a means of, of community improvement. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd like to think that I kind of came up through all of that and that's something that I can bring to the classroom here. Well, that's a great story. And, and it's, uh, it's certainly uh, one where you know, you've come by it naturally. Uh, the, the education has been in your blood you know, from, from day one. Uh, LaDonna, how about your, your story? Um, you know, you come from a big family. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about uh, family life and where you grew up and your education and, and decision to, to become an academic. Hey, well, also thank you, Lou, for inviting us to, uh, to speak with you today. I would say for me, I, I grew up with 10 siblings and we were raised by a single mother. And to say we lived below the poverty line is a delicate way of putting it. But along with that, my mother instilled in us a strong, a strong value of education from an early age. And some of my earliest, most fond memories, and um, my sibling asked me not to share this, but I'm going to anyway, is growing up in the summers in Youngstown, Ohio, it would be hot and be sweaty, a lot like how it is here in South Bend, actually. And we, were, we grew up poor, so we had to be super creative in the way we played. And one of the most fun games we played in the summers, we would play school. And I mentioned how we didn't have a lot of money, but we were creative. So we knew that if you can find a certain rock outside in our yard, it worked as chalk. And so what we would do is turn our dresser backwards and that would function as a chalkboard. So we would play school. I would be a teacher. My older sibling would be the principal. I had my own curriculum. I made my own textbooks. And that's how we spent our summers. We had a lot of fun. And I think those early games instilled in me a desire to teach. I've always known that I wanted to be a teacher. And as I got a little bit older at about age 10, so we're doing this very young, doing these games. At about age 10, I, I mentioned when you grow up poor, often people give you things, give you old things. And so someone had left a box with a bunch of old books piled up in it. Well, again, I, I enjoyed reading. So I opened up one of the books and it was a collection of plays. And I read this hilarious play called The Boar. And I decided we're gonna stage this play. We're gonna perform it outside for all of our neighbors. I cast my siblings in it. Uh, uh, one of the older ones agreed to take part in this. And like any good theatrical endeavor, I paid my actors. They would receive $1 at the end of the show, but several of them dropped out of the show. But the funny thing about this whole experience is it wasn't until years later when I attended college that I found out that play that was so funny and it was written by this playwright, I couldn't pronounce their name. When I went to college, I found out it was Anton Chekhov, this famous Russian playwright. So I was engaging with Chekhov at the age of 10, not knowing it, and my siblings were as well. And the show, um, it, it did not, it wasn't completely finalized, but it, it really, I think, established that desire to perform and to be involved in theater from a very early age. Uh, what, a, what a great story. Uh, I, uh, we have five children and we have two parents and, and we're at wit's end most of the time. So I, I mean, kudos to, seriously to your mother um, being able to raise 10 of you and, and for you to turn out the way you are to be giving back to so many um, is, is not only an incredible tribute to yourself, but also to your upbringing and to your family and those dynamics are very, very powerful. Um, how, let me ask each of you, um, Start with Mark. You were at Emory uh, as a professor for 25 years. Um, how did we convince you three years ago to to come to Notre Dame uh, from that background? And uh, and how has that transition been? What what have you discovered here? Sure. Yeah, I started my career straight out of graduate school. Uh, went to um, 
Emory and went from assistant to full professor there and um, was planning to stay there. And two things happened at the same time and it was just kind of serendipitous that they kind of uh, intersected and, and it ended up in me um, making the decision to come here. On, the, on my side, I had started a new area of research that really um, kind of stretched the boundaries of the discipline of English um, and stretched the geographic location for African-American literature. I was working outside of the US and working outside of English um, but also making claims to these uh, writers as being part of the conversation for American and African-American literature. Um, and so it became a question as to whether I could find a home, a, a supportive home for this new, new work. And exactly the same time, a former uh, colleague of mine from Emory who had come here to Notre Dame, John Sitter, who has uh, just a beloved member of this community, became chair of the English department at, uh, at Notre Dame. And he called me a few years ago and said, we have this position in African-American literature, would you be interested? Um, and I looked into it at exactly the same time the English department was making additional hires mm -hmm. into adjacent areas, people working in Latin, Latinx literature and culture uh, no. in the English department. And again, it was a way for the English department to look more uh, broadly in terms of, of its disciplinary uh, affiliations. And I thought, oh, this really may well work. And then I came and interviewed, uh, met my colleagues, and um, it was very clear that this was going to be a very supportive home. Uh, John McGreevy was the uh, dean at the time. My conversation with him was really quite inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he uh, was uh, very supportive of, of a new project that I'm uh, getting off the ground. And so I'll say a little bit more about my research background when the time comes, but that's the short story as to kind of why I was uh, kind of in the position three years ago to be looking around and why Notre Dame in particular really was the spot for me to land. Does it feel like it was a good decision? Well, absolutely, I haven't regretted it a day. Um, my colleagues in English, and I, I should say I'm also in the Department of Africana Studies, right. uh, and my colleagues in both departments are absolutely wonderful, and I've been able to, to find um, between those two departments as well as the Inst Institute for Latino Studies interlocutors for this work that, that's in the Caribbean and in the Spanish-speaking Spanish -speaking, uh, South America, Central and South America, uh, and so um, I found uh, wonderful support for, for the work I'm doing now. Terrific, that's wonderful news. And LaDonna, you're in a different department. You're in FTT or film, television and, and theater. And I'm going back to the, those 10 year old Chekhov plays. So it makes, uh, it flows uh, naturally. Tell us a little bit about your, your research and teaching focus, which is uh, an area I think of, of great interest. Okay. so. For me, my story, a lot of my, my teaching focus and being here at Notre Dame, it's the reason I'm here is because of my great grandmother, Helen Thomas. She was a woman of faith. She believed in a good, strong Catholic education. She was able to negotiate to allow my mother to attend a good Catholic school so she could receive that education. And so here at Notre Dame, I get to do that. I get to shape the future leaders at a good, strong Catholic institution and have a holistic approach to my own research and teaching. And so Helen Thomas, as I grew older, I understood the barriers that were in place for women like Helen Thomas and like my mother. As I started reading the works of Patricia Hill Collins, her famous book, Black Feminist Thought, it's like a, a, a almost like a Bible to me of sorts. And that foundational knowledge learned from, from that book, which I read at Northwestern when I was receiving my PhD, is what I bring to the classroom is that my major focus is recovering the careers, the artistry, the activism of black women, their experiential knowledge. I recover the women like Helen Thomas, whose names don't usually appear in history books. Yeah. And I recover their efforts and I celebrate their acts of resistance and and their wonderful artistry. And then I bring it into the classroom, right? Because if I'm having a conversation with myself, that's not helping anyone. So I bring that into the classroom and I share this information with my students. And actually the, the, the 
the whole reason my, I published my first book, In Search of Our Warrior Mothers, is because a student asked me a question. A student in the classroom said, this is great. You're talking about Amiri Baraka and all of these wonderful, wonderful male playwrights from the 1960s and 70s. What mm -hmm. were women writing? And I didn't have an answer. And no one else had really done a lot of work on women playwrights of this era. And so that was that first book is the answer to that question. And now I get to teach awesome classes here at Notre Dame. My favorite and probably most popular class is called Performing Blackness from Othello to Jay-Z, where we look at the performance of blackness as a, as a means of political galvanization, which we're seeing happening right now in terms of performance on the stage and on the streets. And that's what, what we study. So we go from Shakespeare to Jay-Z all yeah. in one semester. It's so I, I think my son uh, it, it took that class. Are um, you serious? <laughs> I'm serious. He took a, I thought that he took a class that was titled um, The History of the Black Male from Othello to Jay-Z. So maybe I got that a little bit wrong. No, there's, there are not, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. There are not a lot of classes that say from Othello to Jay-Z. We'll have to talk at another point. We'll I want to talk, and he loved it. And, 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 and as a parent, um, it was I was really, really grateful that that he was in that class because he he learned a lot. It was it was he was, you know, it, it was it challenged his thinking. It offered kind of new perspectives. And uh, he's taken a couple um, Africana studies classes that being, I think, cross listed in Africana studies as well. Uh -huh. Right. And he yeah. really really enjoyed it. Obviously, he was not that memorable a student, so that doesn't surprise me. It's the same as me, same as me, Louis Nani, but it might be a little different. Yes. Maybe, yeah, yeah. The one that struggled in class the most. I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Uh, you know, but but he loved the class. So thank you as a father. Thank you as a father for, you know, for, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that education. Um, you're coming out with a second book. What What is your second book about now? So my second book looks at, so the first book looked at four Black women dramatists of the era, and specifically in New York, in Harlem. That was the focus. This next book is an oral history of Black women who did, who were dancers, who were poets, who were playwrights, directors, all of the spectrums of the arts, as well as political activists, members of the Black Panther Party. So I conducted about 30 interviews. So yes, I'm more comfortable on your end of the spectrum than on this end, on this seat. But I conducted interviews with them from across the country about their experiential knowledge, compiled it into an oral history book, and it's forthcoming in October of this year. So really excited about that. Congratulations. That's really great to get the second book done. So Mark, tell us a little bit about uh, your research uh, area of focus. And then if you wouldn't mind, I'd, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about, um, you know, you're taking a leadership role in an interdisciplinary um, um, center on on race. And, and uh, tell us a little bit more about that too. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, I began my career in uh, researching and teaching uh, the Harlem Renaissance, and I still do work. I'm still working on a volume in the, on the Harlem Renaissance. I still teach courses uh, on the Harlem Renaissance, and that's African-American writing or, or expressive culture more broadly um, during the 1920s and 1930s. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the relationship between that movement and modernism, um, the larger kind of called mainstream modernism um, Faulkner, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, T.S. Eliot, the ways in which these black writers are in conversation um, with these modernist writers. And so uh, that's where my research uh, career began. And then as, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, um, I took a turn to the Caribbean and into South America. And so um, I did a book on a Afro-Cuban soldier uh, during the last war of Cuban independence um, and I'm about to finish uh, with the co-editor, my co-editor, uh, Nora Arieta, um, translations of two Afro-Colombian um, uh, poets from Cartagena. Uh, and I will be working on um, one or two Afro-Ecuadorian writers. I spent um, uh, a year uh, researching Afro-Ecuadorian um, literature and culture two years ago now. Okay. And so um, the two might be might seem kind of disparate, 
Harlem Renaissance writers and Afro-Colombian writers. But the through line for me is really investigating the ways in which black writers use the printed word and use print culture more broadly, the ways in which the printed word is disseminated um, to express themselves, of course, but also to make claims to inclusion, to personhood, to humanity, and therefore a way for them to participate in their local and national communities. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just the way in which black writers use literature uh, to advance their own political agendas, individual as well as, as communal, community uh, political agendas is, is what links the two um, in my mind. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a point I try to make for, for my students. And so um, that work has hopefully prepared me for this work on the center. And I'll just say something very briefly about the center. And then uh, you can ask us both um, questions to more sure. detail, depending on, on what you need to know. Uh, so. Uh, at the beginning of, of Dean Sarah Mustillo's tenure as, uh, as Dean of the College of Arts and Letters, uh, she came in talking about the necessity of a center on race at Notre Dame. So this has been her vision from the beginning. Uh, at the beginning of this calendar year, January of 2020, she asked me to help her put a commu uh, committee together to design a, a center on race. And so we, um, we began meeting at, uh, at the beginning of February uh, and we're still meeting and we're still writing, but we're very close to being able to submit something to her. But what she charged us with at the very, the very first meeting was coming up with a, with a vision of a center for the 21st century, mm -hmm. a center for the 21st century, a center for the 21st century academy, one that would chart the future for similar centers across the country. And so that's what we've been working on. Um, and very briefly, uh, the notion of the center is that it will be one that examines and researches race, ethnicity, and their relationship to issues of power and inequality. Mm -hmm. What we're commonly now talking about in terms of systemic racism. Yeah. Uh, we will, the center will, will train resources, both physical, both personnel, as well as, as material resources on that research, as well as other ways in which to, to reflect on these issues. And at the same time, it will be a center that celebrates and supports communities of color. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be a center that creates space for people to, to come together, as well as a center that um, highlights the ways in which communities of color have responded to these systems of, of oppression and, and exploitation. Fantastic. Well, you know, I can tell tell you as a, as a Notre Dame grad, I, I I went and lived in Santiago, Chile for a couple of years under the Pinochet dictatorship, and then I I worked in the Dominican Republic along the Haitian border for three years, and before coming to work at a homeless center here in South Bend for about eight years. I actually married a woman from Brazil, and uh, so all of our children are dual citizens, and uh -huh. we go back to Brazil pretty regularly. So I'm interested in that that Afro Latino, um, you know, connection that you make here. But but I would say this is that as wonderful as my Notre Dame education was, probably back in the day where Notre Dame least prepared me, and would be the only area that sort is that I was not prepared um, to deal with diversity in the world, in the workplace, and especially ethnic diversity. And so I think um, a center on race and ethnicity is something that um, would be welcomed by all of our students and help them to prepare. And it's interesting to me that you guys were working on this before all of the racial unrest has kind of taken over the nation and, and, uh, and, and become uh, at the forefront of all the issues that we're dealing with once again. So. LaDonna, tell us a little bit about what, what your view is on this center and how, from your own perspective and an FTT world, you might be able to collaborate with it. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just say that I think you hit the nail right on the head in terms of, of Notre Dame. It is an excellent university, excellent. But one of the things that we can improve on is in terms of our conversations about race. We know right now that we have wonderful centers that are doing a lot of 
just excellent work. But right now we don't actually have a center that's dedicated to the study of race specifically. And most top 20 universities have done so and they've established these centers decades ago. So mm -hmm. we're a little bit behind the times. And so the last few weeks with all of this social unrest that's happening right now has underscored this urgency to do anti-racist work right here and now. And universities just in general are just in this fantastic position to think about race, to not only think about race, but take action, right? To address the most pressing concerns of our time. And Notre Dame is in this perfect position to especially contribute to these conversations. We have that history of Father Hesburgh, right? During the civil rights movement, being a part of that, that voice for social change. And we don't want to be left behind in this critical moment. We want Notre Dame to align itself on the right side of history. And this is, this is integral to our Catholic character. It compels us to do this work. It's in our mission statement, right? So the center allows us to realize many of these components that are already exist, but to just do more. And yeah. this is the opportunity. And it's honestly a blessing to be a part of it. That's fantastic. And it would seem that the arts are a way in which, you know, the African-American community, the black community has, um, is prominently played a role that, that has transcended ethnicity and had a huge impact on this country. So it would seem that you'd have a unique contribution to bring. I think so. I think that one of the things that I'm sure Mark can, can explain more about it that, that we would like to do is have the arts be integral to the center. One of the things that helps the center uh, be unique in that factor and lead us into the 21st century to be a part of that. Mark, did you wanna speak more about that? Yeah. Well, thank you, LaDonna. You could go right ahead. That's fine. <laughs> but uh, LaDonna is absolutely right. Um, one of the things that kept coming up in our meetings again and again uh, is this notion of resistance. Um, that when we talk about race, we're not only talking about racism, we're not only talking about um, systems of, of, of exploitation and domination, we're also talking about communities and the ways in which they speak to themselves and they speak to uh, adjacent communities and the way in which they identify themselves. And so as we were talking more about resistance, um, the notion, of, okay, well, how do we also balance this? How do we, we talk about both at the same time? And we said, okay, we can do this through the arts. And so understanding the arts as a, uh, in terms of expressive culture as a means by which communities of color define themselves, assert themselves, um, and recuperate or respond heroically, as Ralph Elson would say, uh, mm -hmm. to, um, to adverse circumstances. And so if I can just say a little bit about some of the nuts and bolts uh, to, to flesh this out. Um, so the, 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 the center will be comparative and global in its critical approach and its scope, uh, which is to say that it will be trained on racism in the US, but also it will be comparative in its ability to look at racism in the United States in comparison to other countries and thereby gain a particularly um, insightful vantage point on it. It will also, uh, in order to execute this, um, have three areas of focus, research, education, and community outreach, com community empowerment, as, as, as we're saying, um, in, as we talk in, in, in the in the, uh, on the committee. And each one of those components will have an artist artistic dimension to it. So mm -hmm. research will have uh, paired with it an artist in resident mm -hmm. who, will, um, uh, who will be pursuing her or his own um, brand of, of form of artistic expression and sharing that with the rest of the Notre Dame and Michigan community. The education component will always have um, an art, uh, an arts dimension as well as the, um, the community empower empowerment or community outreach part of our program uh, in that whatever kind of arts uh, expression we're pursuing at the time, um, at the very least, we'll have multiple sites uh, so that of course we'll always be inviting people onto Notre Dame's campus, but we'll also be moving off of campus uh, mm -hmm. to have shows, exhibits, 
um, film series, et cetera, in the greater Michiana community mm -hmm. and to be in constant conversation with, um, with the community that surrounds uh, Notre Dame, both here on campus and beyond. Fantastic. So really, I can't tell you how excited I am that, uh, that the center is going to be launched. I'm really glad to see that it's uh, one of the core pillars you know, for Dean Mastillo, you know, right, you know, from the onset of her deanship. Um, so LaDonna, what are the steps that are necessary to, to bring this center into reality? What do you think the timetable is going to be? And how can philanthropy help you in what you're trying to do? Okay, well, this center is going to be a hub for what's already happening on campus. We're going to bring wonderful people together and how we're going to do that is we have uh, certain steps that need to be taken. And one of them is we need to establish an organizational structure. Sounds super sexy, but believe me it is. So <laughs> we will appoint a director to handle the day-to-day -day operations of the center to realize all of the wonderful programming that Mark has just talked about. We also need to recruit faculty. We know that there are amazing faculty already at Notre Dame who are doing work on race and we want to amplify their voices and bring them together. The third thing we need to do, and this is a lot of work, is we need to hire faculty. We need to recruit amazing faculty throughout the US and throughout the world that are talking about these issues and bring them together so Notre Dame can be a, can be a leader in talking about these complex and important pressing issues of our day. It's a lot of work, but we're ready for it. And in order to make that happen, we need your partnership. We need partnership with anyone who is listening, anyone who is interested in helping to support these endeavors. We're, we're deeply concerned about the undergraduate experience here. We want to promote amazing programming. We want to have a race studies major and minor so we can continue these conversations in the classroom. But we need wonderful faculty to make that happen and we need your partnership. So, if you really love what we're talking about, then we would really love it if those who are listening can spread the word, that we can let others know of the incredible center that we're building here and get people excited to become a part of it. We really want your partnership. Fantastic. So when you talk about race and ethnicity, you're mm -hmm. talking about um, kind of multi-races and ethnic groups, right? It isn't just a, a Black or African-American yeah. initiative. That's yeah. one of the most important things right now is that we want to tease out the idea of race being something that's central to blackness. Blackness is definitely a part of the conversation, but we, we recognize that these systems of oppression, that while they operate differently with, with different demographics, that there is a lot of commonality and we want to bring people together. We recognize that racism is a global issue. It's a human rights issue. Right. And we feel that Notre Dame is a wonderful space to start having these conversations. I mean, they are happening, but we really want to bring everyone together in one unified center and be really on the forefront of these conversations. Well, you work on that, putting that vision together and I promise you uh, we'll do our part to try to disseminate that and invite people to, uh, to participate and support um, launching this. It sounds like an absolutely wonderful and essential um, vision for Notre Dame. Let me ask one final question to, to both of you. So um, this upcoming semester, obviously classes begin in about 10 days, has to be unlike anything that you have experienced before. So trying to, to and you, you also are coming off the second half of this past semester, which was kind of an abrupt turn to virtual classes. What have you learned as educators and uh, how are you hoping to uh, grow and adapt uh, to this upcoming semester? I, I think uh, I'll go first. For me, the, I'm, I, I realize that I'm very anal in terms of my preparation. I begin preparing for classes about six months in advance. I have my lectures planned out probably even more than that in advance. So I love order. I love systems. I love time management. And COVID just completely did away with all of that. And so I think the the most important thing I learned is to be flexible and mm -hmm. to show grace, to show grace for everyone. Everyone needs it right now and to be super flexible in terms of my own teaching and how I approach that. And so one of the things that I've had to, to deal with is just learning to be present in the moment, to make the most of the opportunities that present themselves at that time. And I'm going to encourage my students to do that as well. If COVID does come back in a, in a strong way, hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, but should, should the, the worst happen, 
I know that we will make the most of every single class session. Mm -hmm. That is my goal. Mm -hmm. and, and we're going to talk about how it's impacting theater. Right now, theaters have gone dark. That means they're closed. Right. Theater's not happening. Right. So what does that mean for us as theater artists? So we're going to have those really important conversations. Fantastic. You know, let me ask you one the last thing. You've got four relatively young children. And my understanding is that you're a certified crafting diva. On top of that, and I don't even know exactly what that means. So tell us about that. It means that I love crafting and it is my passion and I am amazing at it. That's what it means. It means that I, I've taught my kids at a young age to like, if you want to craft, if, if we don't have anything that's like store-bought, you just pick something up and you paint it and you make it look amazing. So now my kids are super confident in their skills. So even during summer, I decided to paint their bedroom and do my own chalkboard wall using grout and paint. I do my own mixture. So I'm doing that bright blue because that's what the kids want. They walk in and they say, can we help? And I say, no, 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 you're too young. Let me do this. And they go, oh, no, I know how to do this, mom. I can do it and I can be careful and no paint will land on the floor. See, I can do it. So I'm sitting there and watching them like, Oh, they're going to get paint everywhere. And they're like, look, mom, there's no way you could have done this without us. We're really fast. It would have taken you days to do that. And I'm looking at them like it is taking days, right? <laughs> so it, it means that I teach my kids to be confident and we just have fun. We make That's everything terrific. be a craft. That's terrific. And you're also a crime show enthusiast. What is the best crime show ever on television? I almost got away with it. It's a series, it's from the early 90s, and it shows people committing these crimes and how they get caught. So some people look at it and think, LaDonna, you want to commit many crimes, don't you? But no, the whole thing is they get caught and they tell you how they got caught. So that's yeah. one of my favorite crime shows to watch when I'm running on the treadmill. I almost got away with it. It's no longer I almost got away with it. That's great. We'll have to check that out. So Mark, top that for us, uh, you, you know, uh, tell us how you're going to be prepared for this next semester and how you've adapted your own pedagogy, but, but maybe throw in a little interesting fact that we wouldn't otherwise know about you. Oh my goodness. I, I don't know if I can top that, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll just throw in what, what I can. Well, I have to say that, uh, Lou, my experience teaching online last semester was really um, edifying and endearing in that my students adapted much quicker, much more quickly than I did. Mm -hmm. um, I was teaching an undergraduate course and a graduate course, um, and the students, you know, they, they, in terms of the mechanics, they were helping me. You know, I was still figuring out how to share my screen and 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 things like that. They were helping me with that, and then um, in terms of the class dynamics. I like to have a class that's highly interactive where students are not just speaking to me, but they're speaking to each other. Um, students really leaned in, they really dug in and um, tried to overcome the kind of two dimensionality of Zoom uh, where they're in conversation with one another in conversation with the text at hand in conversation with me as well. And so I was, um, I was really pleasantly surprised where at the beginning, I was so nervous that this just would not work, uh, mm -hmm. that the chemistry that we had established in the first half of the semester would just be gone. Uh, right. But the students were really, really um, uh, intentional and dutiful about sustaining that. So I was really gratified. And at the end of the semester, uh, for both groups, students went out of the way and, and to, to tell me how much they had gotten out of the course. And I felt so good about that because I just wasn't sure whether it was as, as um, edifying as I had planned at the beginning of the semester when none of us were anticipating COVID. And so looking forward to this, this fall, um, I have a, uh, a, a USIM that is, a, you know, a, a, a class for incoming students. So this will be for first year students, their very first experience of college. And for right now, it will be in class, but of course, we'll be with masks and we'll be six feet apart. And so it'll be somewhat antiseptic. It'll be, a, you know, a, a kind of physical space that doesn't necessarily can, uh, um, make itself conducive to the kinds of interchanges that make um, the class as, as vibrant as I want it to be. So we're going to have to figure out ways to, to make it vibrant. And so I'm, I'm going to call on my students to experiment with me and kind of lean in with me. And I have a graduate class um, and we'll, we'll do the same. So you wanted something 
personal about me yeah, as well? Exactly, yes. Okay, I don't craft. I'm awful with my hands. I, I, I'm a runner, though. Um, and so I, um, in fact, when I get out, I'm going for a run in the middle of the day, as soon as we log off, I just feel it coming. But um, it's it's one of my my main stress busters, and so I run, and when I can, I race five k's and some an occasional ten k. Yeah, fantastic. Well, let me tell you, I um, I've really enjoyed the conversation. If I were a student again, I would love to take both of your courses, and uh, we're really grateful that uh, that you you've each chosen uh, to be distinguished members of Notre Dame's faculty. I know it is to the betterment of our students, but, but also the whole community. And we're really excited about seeing this new center come into fruition and, and helping to, su to support it so that it can grow and have the impact both in our community here at Notre Dame and certainly well beyond. So um, kudos to you both, prayers as you begin a new semester and, uh, and for your families with all the challenges on so many different levels. Um, just know that uh, that we're grateful that you're here and uh, we're, we're, we're there to be of help in any way we can. So take care. God bless. Thank you guys both. Um, to our viewing audience, um, I want to let you know that next Friday, um, we're going to meet next Friday for um, another broadcast, which will be August 7th. And that is going to be with the James E. Rohr Director of Athletics, Jack Swardrick. So Jack will be joining us, and I know there's going to be, we'll have a lot more news, what's going to happen. I know this is on a few people's minds with the football season, the fall sports seasons, and, and we believe hopefully at that point Jack will have uh, maybe not all of the answers, but some of the answers. So um, plan on tuning in at noon on next Friday, August 7th. And, uh, and so um, as we have done before, um, any of you from your homes that would like to join in, uh, I'd like to just uh, uh, close us uh, with a Hail Mary. Uh, and so please uh, join me uh, as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Take care. Thank you all. God bless and go Irish. Bye-bye. Yes, bye-bye.